Greetings, uh, I'm Jim Finley. And I'm Kirsten Oates. Welcome to Turning to the Mystics. Welcome, Jim, to this dialogue about session six, John of the Cross. We're coming towards the end. Yes. I think this is our, uh, your second last session we'll be discussing. Yes. Good to be with you. Good to be with you too. I was struck by, um, there was a wonderful phrase you talked about that uh, we're turning to John of the Cross for guidance. And then you said, what kind of guidance do we get? We get mystical guidance, and uh, I loved hearing that. And today you wanted to start by reading something from John of the Cross to help us enter into that sense of what mystical guidance is. Yes. I I didn't include this um, in the recorded session, but afterwards I thought it's so important, actually, because I did include it in Teresa and Thomas Merton on on this mystical spiritual world, the spiritual worldview of contemplative Christianity. Mm -hmm. And this is John of the Cross's um, commentary on stanza 38 of the spiritual canticle. And the stanza is, and then he's speaking to God, and then you will give me, you, my life, you will give me there what you gave me that other day. Mm. And he's going to comment what he means by that other day. And the reason I think this quote's so important is that in our, just how we're, in our society, we tend to think of the mystical as an experience that we have, or a certain kind of experience. And how do we understand that experience? How to respond to it? And John of the Cross here, like all these mystics, is what is the origins of the mystical experience? Like, where does it start? See? Mm-hmm. And it doesn't start with our experience of it. See? Our mystical experiences are awakening to mystical experience. It has its origins in God. So I'll read the text and then reflect on it for a couple minutes. Wonderful. This is Article 6. Let us see what that other day is, in which she here, that is the soul, mentions, as well as the meaning of the what that God gives her on that other day, in which she asks to have afterwards in glory. By that other day, she means the day of God's eternity, which is different from this temporal day. In that day of eternity, God predestined the soul to glory, decreed the glory. He would bestow on her and give it to her freely from all eternity before he created her. And this what, that is the what that he gave her that other day, is so proper to the soul that no event or adversity, whether great or insignificant, will suffice to take it from her. But she will attain the endless possession of the what to which God predestined her from eternity. And this is the what which she says he gave her that other day, and which she now desires to possess openly in glory. I'd like to comment on this for a minute, Mm. because it's not obviously clear. (laughs) Um, See, what John the Cross is saying here, I think, is that in our lives here on this earth, we first know God, we first know of God's eternal oneness with us as God gifts our finite intellect, illumined by faith with God's infinite oneness with us. So, through the gift of faith, I hear that God's infinitely one with us, God's closer to me than I am to myself, or fear not, Jesus says, and so on. And so, I take those words in, and through my finite intellect, illumined by faith, mediated through those words, I know that God is one with me. Likewise, uh, I know that uh, God's, I know God's desire for me to be one with him, is mediated and given to me through my will. I touch in my will. So in my will, I'm moved in my finite will to move to give myself in love to my faith understanding that God eternally wills me to be one with him, and so on. That is, our knowledge of God, the infinite presence of God, is mediated through our finite intellect, our finite intentions, our finite will, and so on. Efficacious unto holiness. 
it's real, it's true, uh, as in a mirror darkly, mm -hmm. in an obscure certainty, and so on. But when we die and pass through the veil of death into glory, it'll be unmediated, infinite union with the infinite union with God forever in the light of day and glory forever. So John of the Cross is saying, this, what happens on earth here with mystical is infused contemplation as God decides not to wait to begin to introduce us to unmediated union with God, like an infinite union with God, unmediated in the finite, but infinitely given, which is the beginning of the mystical. And this mystical consciousness, which he's now exploring in the canticle, which we come to in Passage to the Dark Night, where did it begin? It began before we existed, because on that other day, God eternally contemplated you in Christ the Word, and you were predestined in Christ the Word to infinite union with the infinite mystery of God. This is not the predestination of Calvin, where some are predestined to be saved and some aren't. Mm -hmm. This is the predestination from eternity before we existed that brings us into existence so in passing through this life we might enter into glory and it might come full circle into infinite union with God. It comes full circle. What mystical union is, is that glory that awaits us in passing through the veil of death, God decides to give it to us now. See, And we start to receive an unmediated it, awareness, an unmediated infinite awareness of the infinite presence of God, infused by God into us. So that's why it's passive. It's from God. It's not our doing. See? And then receiving it, and the dark night frees us up enough to receive it. See? Then we're endowed by God, mystically, to give ourselves in love to the infinite love that gives itself to us. So in the reciprocity of that love, we have mystical union. And on this earth, it's obscure. It's always hidden and obscure, see? but very deep and vast and real and true. See? And so uh, John of the Cross is trying to help us see this big picture where it all starts in God's mind mm -hmm. see, of a dream God has for us. It comes to earth through these mediations of God's presence into glory. But now, with the, myst the charism of mystical awakening, the unmediated union with God is starting now. See, with deep within your heart is the influx of God being. For St. Teresa of Avila, this is, begins with the fourth mansion. You realize your heart's being enlarged to divine proportions. And I think this is important to see this as the, what makes the mystical mystical is having its origins and its destiny in God. See, it doesn't have its origins in our awareness of it. And is it, is it true what the mystics speak of? Is it true for all of us, but we're not aware of it? Or is it, what's, what's the nuance there? It's true for all of us in that it's the essence of our identity as a person created by God in the image and likeness of God. And in that sense, it's true for all of us. It's also true for us that we get intimations of it mediated through faith through consolations, reassurances, like as, through a veil, is true for us. Um, uh, and it's also true for us that I think that we all have moments of mystical awareness, like we're graced with a quickening, we're a realization of the presence of God in and as the mystery of our life. And one is with the beloved, one is with the child, one is with the night. We all have moments where we're a momentary mystic. Um, but but it's not given to all of us. It's a charism. Mm -hmm. See, to have it be your primary thing, it's your it's your primary calling. And it doesn't mean that you're more holy than those who don't have it. Yeah. But rather, it's a charism that helps you to see how ultimately holy everybody is. And so, if it's your vocation, if it if it if it flows into you and tugs at your heart. He's offering, spirit, he's offering spiritual direction to those toward whom they realize this is happening to them, and they have no one to help them understand what's happening. Mm -hmm. That's really helpful, Jim, to start us off there today. You, you talk about the, the other thing that tends to be common with the mystics and their worldview is 
in your words, they assume we've done our homework and set our foundations. And uh, as I reflected on that, it feels like um, like the, the church today isn't necessarily helping us set the kind of foundations that might lead us on this path. Yes. My sense is I think what the church does do in liturgy, in the homilies and liturgy and so on, it, it really does help us to have these mediated awarenesses of discipleship and what it is to follow Christ and how Christ mentors us and how God loves us and we're to respond to love and how we're to respond to God's presence in ourself and one another and in the earth and so on. It does do that. I also think it does the Mass itself or liturgy itself, prayer itself, or prayer. What you don't hear very often is this kind of sense of this possibility of an ever-deepening communion. See? It's realized in kind of a humble simplicity, and we can learn to follow it and listen to it. That's true, you really don't hear that very much, I think also in a lot of churches you don't hear about this idea of oneness. With you God. don't. You don't. I, I, I think in the in the Protestant traditions, you do see it in um, in uh, the prayer meetings, the Amish prayer meetings, and you also see it in the devotional or uh, uh, as uh, some of these deeply prayerful people. But also, the 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 Protestant tradition was formed in the age of the Enlightenment. So when Luther in a badly needed reform of the Roman Church, was badly needed. When he opened up the text, in the interest of the Enlightenment, he saw it as a truth in the text. And so it was, it was reading the Bible outside of the liturgical, sacramental, mythic, aesthetic, contemplative, mystical, philosophical richness, the ethos mm -hmm. of it, where you use apologetics proof text back and forth. And then the church and the Counter-Reformation joined right in. Mm -hmm. And they started quoting other proof texts back. And so, even though it is uh, followed all the way back to the Desert Fathers, Desert Mothers, and to Jesus, this mystical, it kind of got lost along, it's always there, because you can find it in the hearts of contemplative people in monasteries, and it's there, you can go to it, and there, it's right there. But it's it's a kind of a well kept secret, um, and I think a lot of people who feel it tugging at their heart, they they feel something's missing, but they don't know what it is. Yes, and they don't know how to receive guidance in it, which I think is the essence of the living school. Mm -hmm. You know, Thomas Merton is really helping people to become aware of this union and guidance and how to follow it, which is this podcast. Mm -hmm. too. Yeah. Jim, would it be fair to say that the Enlightenment really grounded Christianity into the finite and into the yeah, using the finite senses um, more fully than ever? Yeah, yes. It, it, what it did was, um, using Gabriel's Marcel's language, it grounded it in the, in the realm of reason as an objectively real truth that you can go to and verify through true, like logical elements. And, and what gets missed in all of that, for, for example, in the earlier session I did on levels of marital love, for example, solitude and art, the more two people deeply love each other, the less and less inclined they are to claim that they'd be able to adequately define their love that would do justice to it. See? It's the intimate immediacy of the ineffable of it, and that kind of gets lost. Yes. And I think it's what we're searching for. I think we're trying to get kind of reestablished in our heart yes. in that, yes. So, Jim, when the, when the mystics like John of the Cross and Teresa are assuming we've done our homework and set our foundations, if we haven't uh, built our foundation on this possibility of deepening into oneness or our oneness with God as, as a reality, uh, do we need to reset those foundations? Do we need well, to? I think so, in this sense, about, about mystical awakening, say the taste of oneness and the call to follow, it, it comes as it comes, it's given to whom it's given. 
And sometimes when quite young, a person can be given a taste of this. And you can spend your whole life learning to be faithful to what was given to you there. But what you find is that if you don't build foundations of psychological spiritual maturity, there's always a distance between your awakened heart and your ability to be habitually grounded in a living awareness of that which your heart's been awakened to. Mm -hmm. And so we're circling back around to take care of what does, it, what does it really mean to be a deeply reflective person, mm -hmm. to carefully ponder and reflect upon these things. What does it really mean to ask all things considered, what's the most loving thing I can do right now? For my body, my mind, this person, this family, this community, how do I live that? Okay. What and so on. So, in order to have foundations that supports that which transcends reason, we have to stabilize in the clarity of reason illumined by faith, incarnate and loving attitudes translated into action, and uh, which is holiness. And so, so there's. There's that. So there are, there, are, there are mystical people, that is deeply mystical people, for whom that connect, those connections haven't been made yet. I mean, every, everyone's life is everyone's life. But the idea would be that you grant. So, for example, the cloud of unknowing says, unless we've meditated, he's speaking of this oneness. And he says, unless we've meditated often on Christ and the death of Christ, he said, we will go astray in our purpose. And St. John of the Cross starts out by saying, um, we begin by basing our life on Christ. But how can we do that if we've not studied his life? See? And so it's that deep uh, kind of reflective, prayerful, lived internalizations that they're kind of assuming is the basis, like grace builds on nature, yeah. that we kind of do that. You know? So one of the ways we can reset our foundations towards this journey of oneness would be to read scripture with that that sense of our relationship to god jesus's relationship to god in mind yes i was listening again to another recording i like eugene peterson on the word the minute he's so great and he was talking about he said a lot of people engage in bible study but they don't read it you know? So what is it to open the scriptures like an unlearned child in the presence of God and take to heart you know, everything that Jesus says, every word of scripture, as a lived um, presence within yourself and practicing it until those patterns of incarnate grace start becoming a secondary inner attitude like that. And I think it does require that. Uh, it's, 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 the mystical is greatly helped to the extent we're faithful to doing that homework uh, in this reflective life illumined by faith as the groundedness for which the mystical emerges is, is incarnate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Jim, we were having a different discussion this morning, but uh, just talking about how that can be an, uh, an isolated lonely path because there's not a lot of good community that operates in that manner or, or with that understanding. Yes, I, was, I would like to add something else too. Maybe scripture is not your primary way, you know, to your own self be true. And so it might be like the teachings of the mystics or Thomas Burton or a poet. So what you do is you find first, uh, uh, Master Dogen says, find that person whose words awaken your heart with a desire for the great way and forget everything else. Mm. And so although theologically, Scripture is the foundation, within yourself, it might not be your primary way for Scripture. It might be a certain spiritual teacher, but you found your teacher when the one, they put words to your own heart's longings, like they help you put words to stirrings within you like that. And next, there's a certain loneliness to this in this sense, I think, that... Um, I mean, everyone's living their life doing the best they can. And everyone to his or her, her own way is finding their way. In a community of faith, everyone's living their faith as best they can. You know, everyone in their own way has these mystical moments, this oneness. But where it starts becoming like the foundational lens through which you see everything, it's fairly, it's fairly unusual. 
Mm-hmm. And therefore, there's a certain solitude that comes with it. And um, But you, you realize that you're talking about it all the time, every time you talk with love to somebody. You're not explicating the far-reaching implications of that love talk. See, And then once in a while, you'll look for openings where a person will ask a question, you know, at the birth of a child or a death or a solitude, and you see little openings, have a little discussion. And sometimes you'll find another similarly awakened person. And you can get together with them and share at that level. And so I see one of the values of the podcast are those who are being so drawn find in the podcast these resonances, you know, like a tonal quality, that something's being talked about that can't be defined or conceptually understood, can be interiorly recognized, that this language is about what is emerging within me. But there is a certain loneliness to who it is. But I think it's true with anyone who's radically faithful to a transformative path. It's lonely to be a poet or to be an artist or to devote yourself to the, to the poor where there's like a love path, you invest yourself in it in a way you yourself can't explain it, you know. But if you don't do it, you know you're not being who you're called to be. And uh, that I think that's the solitude, yeah. Just reflecting back when you were talking about um, that the tonal quality, the resonance, the that's really when you found your teacher, right? It, it's, it's that yeah, when you have those kind of sensations that the tonal quality... The Isn't resonance it? in my being, I, I feel drawn to it. It's saying something I long for. It's yeah. That's right. And I also think that since we all are this ontologically in our being, yeah. you can find people talking, you can tell at certain moments they're, they're in this wavelength. You know, there's a kind of a unitive, a kind of open-ended wonder or amazement or fidelity to something. You can kind of tell. But the people who consistently talk at that level and talk about it, and also has to do with our tradition. The person who so touches you might not be in your own tradition. I'm in the Catholic tradition, but maybe a Zen master, a Rumi. I, I can tell, you know, there, it's the point of convergence out of a tradition that transcends all traditions. But I think we're most at home with a mystically awakened voice in our own tradition. So we're open to wherever we hear it, I think. Turning to the mystics will continue in a moment. I wanted to reflect on the discussion you had about deprivation, that uh, the passage through the dark night is, is this sense of being deprived of the ways that we normally had experienced God in our in our finite senses. And I do wonder, you know, back to our discussion about the church and its general teaching, that do you think this this for, for many people this it's a deprivation of noticing that the church isn't isn't meeting that deeper sense. I I remember when I was at church so many people saying, I, I just want to go deeper. I want to go deeper. But there, there didn't seem to be a pathway to, mm-hmm. to get there. Yeah. Depri- yes. But let's say the, uh, about deprivation, which is really asceticism, like a ceases. Uh, let's say that in, in, in any loving relationship, we can tell there might be certain patterns of the way we talk to the person, treat the person, react to the person, that we can tell the person does not experience as loving. But we can tell we've internalized them. Maybe we grew up with it, like withholding intimacy or anger or judgmental or resentment. And so we have to practice a deprivation of these habits, Mm. like survival habits formed in trauma and abandonment. And with God's grace, we need to work and emerge and grow out of that. And I think that a thesis for love asks of us to grow out of and be on patterns that compromise love, but we can tell we're attached to them. Like Merton says, he said, there is in each of us something with which we must struggle very hard where it will destroy us. He said, this is the cross in our life. And so that's our inner work always. 
Uh, it's like an alcoholic. Like mm -hmm. So the alcoholic is, they're addicted to what's destroying them. Mm -hmm. In the process of freeing from it, they know they can't do it except through their higher power. And it's, it's a, a tremendous struggle for their very life, really. But if they see it through and come out the other side, they're so grateful. And then they know that sobriety leads to emotional sobriety, to spiritual sobriety. And um, so John of the Cross is saying all that holds true. He's assuming all that. And uh, in Christian life, our asceticism, our attitudes of the heart that are contrary to this unconditional, merciful love revealed to us in Christ. See, how can I free myself from this with God's grace? John the Cross is saying something more radical than this. Is that to the extent I'm identified with these finite means of experiencing the infinite presence of God, efficacious unto holiness, God in my beliefs, God in my thoughts, God in my aspirations, God in my ministry, God in my struggles. See? As long as I'm identified with that as having the final say in who I am, there's no room for God to infuse into us this infinite union. Mm. So God lovingly weans us off our attachment to those patterns by simply taking it away from us. Mm -hmm. So we go to our place of prayer and we're not nurtured by prayer. We're not nurtured by meditation. And if we stay the course, if we just stay there and let it do its work in us, he said we begin to realize, uh, not at first, we begin to realize the emergence of this general loving awareness without regard for anything in particular, which is the gate of heaven. See? And it's through that quiet openness that the, this uh, influx of God's presence streams unexplainably into our heart. And I, that's the sense of it I have. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You mentioned that it unfolds in our limitations, this infinite kind of experience. What did you mean by that? I mean by, let, let's say I'm drawn this way. And I, 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 I see what my awakened heart's prompted me to do. I'm being encouraged to follow the guidance of God and moving beyond the frontiers of my own abilities, you know. I'm being moved by God into a kind of a sweet powerlessness to let God have her way with me, to be kind of, I, I can tell that. See? And then I start monitoring how well I'm able to pull that off. <laughs> <laughs> and I go, you know, this isn't going well. Like, uh, you know, unless something kicks in here pretty soon. This isn't uh -huh. going to, this isn't going to, I don't know if this is going to work for me. <laughs> so the, the, the book, John of the Cross's book, The Dark Night of the Soul, is the faults of beginners. And he takes the seven capital sins. And he talks about people not yet awakened. And what they're all about, really, is they say, for example, the sin of, of aver, or pride. Uh, the sin of pride is that the, what they start doing is they start comparing themselves to other people and start realizing they're more holy than the people around them. Or they get jealous that other people seem to be holier than they are. Like that. So he goes down the whole litany where you're not freed up. So the whole issue is this, I think, really. Yes, I'm on this path. And yes, because I'm just a finite human being, being unexplainably drawn to you, I can't do this. But I don't have to because you take me to yourself unexplainably in my inability to do it, see, which is the gift of tears. See? It's the gift of tears. And uh, I think that's what it, uh, you know, to me that's the feel of it. We, we, we can't do it. That's what I mean by you can drop the thimble into the ocean, but you can't get the ocean into the thimble. Mm -hmm. see? So as long as we're still trying to get the ocean into the thimble, that's confusion. And that's the ego trying to attain something or not attain something. But if we drop the thimble into the ocean, uh, that which we cannot attain is attaining us and our inability to attain it. Mm -hmm. So the deep acceptance of the limit is actually the place where God enters into our heart deeply. So it becomes more and more boundaryless or more and more unexplainable or more and more, you know, vast. Mm -hmm. In our, in, our, in our ordinariness. That's really helpful. I, I just want to repeat that. Becky said something like at the, at the place of the limit, if we can deeply accept our own limit, 
to attain God or to that's that's where that cooperation can begin to happen where we yes yeah you know the way I put it I was from an earlier talk Martin Heidegger speaks of two different ways of understanding the horizon he said one way is the horizon is the point beyond which we can't see so if I go to the ocean side of the house I look out at the horizon I can't see over the horizon he said there's a more interior way of understanding the horizon the horizon is the point at which the un infinite unmanifested is manifesting itself. So in contemplative consciousness, the palms of my hands are God's horizon. See, my beating heart is God's horizon. You know, the, it, the divinity of the immediacy of things is my horizon. Adding to that, my limits are God's horizon. Because my limitations, deeply accepted, is God's limitless presence pouring itself and giving itself to me and overflowing mm. my limits in the midst of my limits. See? Uh, it's like that. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, really beautiful. Well, I wanted to ask you if you'd be willing to uh, turn back to the Merton quotes you offered in, in the session um, so that we might unpack them a little bit together. Yes. So we're, on, we're, we're using Thomas Merton's book, The Inner Experience, Notes on Contemplation. Yes. And we're in Chapter 6. That's right. And I want to say something, too. I might have mentioned this. This is the book that Merton was writing when he died mm. in his Hermites. So this is like his final thing. And then he went to Asia and died there in Asia. So he died there with it unpublished. And so it was posthumously published. So you get the latest Merton. Wow. on this, living as a hermit uh, in the monastery. And um, he directly refers here to St. John of the Cross and directly refers to this uh, canticle, this infused contemplation, the mystical contemplation. It's mystical because it's God acting in us, in consciousness and in our heart. And he makes a number of bullet points to help us guess what this infused contemplation is. And so the first is a, it's an intuition that is this infused contemplation. It is an intuition that at its lower level transcends the senses. So it's, a, can you hear that noise outside? Only right. slightly. Oh, 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 beautiful, that's good. Did you Me hear too. my dogs bark earlier? I, I, I did, only slightly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I couldn't hear the snoring though. You mentioned it. All right, okay, let's move on. So, so here's what it is. So let's say I'm sitting in prayer, and let's say there's this influx of this infused contemplation coming. And um, I can tell something very important is happening, but I can't explain it. See? So what, a place to begin is it transcends the senses, the emotions. It may overflow into the senses as an inner warmth, but it's very clear that the overflow in the senses is infinitely less then what it is is flowing into us. So I'm I'm beyond then uh, sensible consolations in the senses. What's important is I'm also beyond the deprivation of consolation in the senses, like in the dark night, because if the deprivation of consolation is just the deprivation of what's infinitely less than what I'm looking for, it's unexplainably giving itself to me. So we're kind of crossing over here in the senses, beyond the senses, and on its higher level, transcends the intellect itself. See? So anything I'm even capable of comprehending or thinking see, is infinitely less than the divine knowledge that's being secretly infused into me. It's God's knowledge of God and God's knowledge of who I am in God being infused into me transforming me into itself as my knowledge mm. see, given to me by God. And that's the first point. Can I ask a question about that? Sure, okay. sure. I wonder if this is a, an experience of what this is describing, but often when I'm even like listening to your sessions to prepare for, for these dialogues, there's like a, a, I have to go very slowly. I'm often pausing and uh, having to take a break and coming back, but there's like a sweet pain to the listening. Like I, I, I um, it's hard to describe, but it's almost like uh, it's just on the edge of overwhelm. You know, yes, like I, yes. I, I, yeah. And 
I know it's true and real and beautiful what I'm listening to, and I, but I, I, I kind of have to titrate myself a little bit, yeah. you know. Yeah. You know, years ago I was giving a retreat up in Northern California, uh, at the center up there, and um, it was a a, a Catholic a Zen Roshi, a Zen master up there, Sensei Thomas Han, and there was a, a Catholic a Sensei Buddhist gathering there, Zen gathering. And they asked me to speak there. And so I spoke like this to the group. And a person raised her hand. She was a, happened to be a nun. And she said, you know, my, I have some of my friends here, and they all know I'm not an emotional person. But sometimes, as I listen to you, for some reason, I want to cry. Mm. And I said, well, you know what? When I'm talking, I want to cry. Too. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, see, that's, that's, Eckhart calls it the rim of eternity. I think it also has to do, you go through an art museum, like the hushed silence of the museum, and there's a certain moment you're standing there in complete silence, and you're at the edge of yourself. Mm -hmm. Do I mean there's something so uh, intimate, so unexplainably intimate, that you know is very, very important, see? And you're at the, you're at the sweet edge of yourself, which is really the hidden center of yourself. Mm -hmm. And so this language, this mystical language, it's a language in the service of the unsayable, where the cadence or rhythms of the language embody the unsayable. It makes it a living word. It goes right to the heart, I think. And uh, that's my sense of it. Yes, yeah, that really resonates, that sense of being right at the edge of myself. And yeah, yeah, yeah. I, it's, it's hard to hang out there for a long time. It, 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 it is, and we don't need to. But I do think this, if we make frequent visits, <laughs> if we make, see, if we just do it every so often, like it touches us, it, yeah. touches a, it touches us. Or if we just occasionally s surrender ourselves over to it. Mm -hmm. it it's, so, uh, it's so delicate, we don't stay long enough to let it have its way with us. Mm. But if we keep making faithful to the, to the visitations, little by little by little, sometimes it's very slow, like water filling the marshlands, it's very hard to discern the point at which it happened. But there was a tipping point mm -hmm. at which little by little it's become habitual. See? And that's what these mystics are about. They're trying to guide us to that point because it's what happened to them. Yeah. It's what happened to them. And they say they're offering spiritual direction uh, for those who are being drawn this way. And they know how hard it is to receive guidance in it because it's so obscure yeah. and, and delicate. But I think that's a big part of it, that edge of oneself. And then realizing as longer you sit with it, it's really the hidden center of yourself. Wow. From which you've become exiled by the centrifugal force of circumstance, like you've been drawn out to reactivity, to the coming and goings of things, you know. So, so helpful, thank you. It, yeah, yeah. Number two, because it's beyond the intellect and beyond the senses, number two. Hence, it is characterized by a quality of light and darkness. See? It's like an interior seeing of what I can't see, see? or like an, a deeper way of understanding what I can't understand. See, It's when I try to reach out to have it, it recedes further away. Mm. When I surrender that I can never have it, it draws closer. You know, it has that Myst like we, we, we learn to like live in that betwixt and between place where the union becomes habituated. See, knowing and unknowing is beyond feeling and even beyond concepts. But there are the concepts that bear witness to what's beyond concepts, which are the teachings of the mystics. Yeah. <laughs> so right now we're using concepts. You yes. know I mean? These are words on a page, but there are a certain kind of concept. You know, it's a concept that embodies the transconceptual realization they're attempting to share with us. Like yes, I love that, uh, those phrases, they're so helpful, light in darkness, knowing in unknowing. There's a, there's a kind of knowing that acknowledges unknowing yes. as the ground of knowing. It, and, that's, yeah. it, that's it. And I, I think I said to the student in the, in the podcast that, um, John the Cross says, and God grants it to some people to understand that everything remains to be understood. Mm. And to understand that everything remains to be understood is a deeper way to understand what it means to understand, see, which is God's knowledge unexplainably living itself in our heart. 
you know, and how can I learn to be comfortable with that or see it as, you know what I mean? It's that. It's yes. Kind of like it's discovering one's own unique way of breathing that air and, and sharing it. It makes you quite humble as well, reading reading that phrase because, and I guess this is part of the isolation too, because even um, we're being told it's unexplainable, so yeah, yeah. it's hard to talk about, it's hard to explain. It's hard, yeah, so yes. there's a humility but, to being on this yeah. path. John of the Cross says we should cherish, we should not cherish what we understand, but what we don't understand. Mm. Because what we do understand conceptually in reflective consciousness, what we do understand is finite what we don't understand is infinite yeah but there's a, a deeper way to understand which is a kind of intimate ununderstanding see like yes. pardon me i don't speak english <laughs> you know what i mean i don't but i can recognize when it's being talked about see? yeah that that's the thing i know what it's being that's why he calls it a what the what that was given to me that day see something was given to me that day but i don't know what it is I can't grasp what it is, but I can realize that I, I, I can join God in knowing who God knows me to be in a deep realization I can never explain. Yeah. It's amazing the subtlety uh, built into his words and the way it, he offers yeah. the teaching. It's just, that's amazing. And I think, too, that's why we need to be, if, if, if you're drawn to do it, to sit with these passages and just love being perplexed, <laughs> you know, seriously. Yeah. And as you just read it slowly, like a riddle or a koan or a parable, and then pick out one sentence that touches your heart and keep reading on. And the longer you do that, like connecting the dots, things that were before unclear start becoming clear because you're getting acclimated. We're like drawn into this, you know, that's the contemplative lexio. I think. Yes. Lovely. Number three, in this contact with God in darkness, there must be a certain activity of love on both sides. Mm. Uh, first of all, on the side of God, it's already taken care of because God's <laughs> infinite love. God's got it. God's got it covered. God's got it covered. <laughs> but on the side, but on the side of the soul, there must be a withdrawal from attachment to sensible things. A liberation of the mind and imagination from all strong emotional passion thoughts and thoughts. It doesn't mean that we would draw from sensuality or the senses, because look how sensual this poetry is. Mm -hmm. But we would draw from attachment to the sensual. Mm. Because to the extent we can claim it or have it or not have it, we're being led beyond having and not having. So there's a spirituality of sensuality. You know, there's this spirituality. Uh, of, of knowing beyond conceptual knowing. So that's mm -hmm. the subtlety of yeah. this need to keep oneself kind of clear-minded about what one's about. Yeah. You know, what one feels called to do. Merton uses that word clinging. It's such a helpful word. It, clinging, it is. It is. Clinging it to is. It. Yeah. yeah. And again, the subtlety of it is not to cling to the extent that one's not able to stop clinging and get disheartened. See? like drafts. I thought I could learn not to cling, <laughs> but it's still clean. So one even has to be completely detached, letting God's will work in us as we are, like we're a work in progress, mm -hmm. surrendered in this love. Yeah. And four, contemplation is the work of love, and the contemplative proves his love by leaving all things, even the most spiritual of things for God, in nothingness, detachment, and night. But the deciding factor in contemplation is the free and unpredictable action of God. He alone can grant the gift of mystical grace and make himself known by the secret and effable contact that reveals his presence in the depths of the soul. What counts is not the soul's love for God, but God's love for the soul, which transforms the soul into itself, secretly and interiorly in poverty and humility and unexplainableness like that. And then jump down to six, see. Five. This knowledge of God, five, is not, an unknowing, is not intellectual, nor even in the strict sense, affective emotions. It is not the work of one faculty or another, uniting the soul with this object outside of itself. It is the work of interior union and identification in divine charity. One knows God by becoming one with him. One apprehends him 
by becoming the object of his infinite mercies. And lastly, number six, just in capital letters. Contemplation is a supernatural, that is, it's a godly God knowledge. Contemplation is a supernatural love and knowledge of God, simple and obscure, infused by him into the summit of the soul, that is, the innermost hidden center of the soul, giving it a direct and experiential contact with him that's hidden. And he says, to find the treasure that is hidden, you yourself must become hidden. So you must become detached. But the thing is, in this hidden, because it's completely hidden from the one who's receiving it, but it radiates out a gentle light, see, that illumines the faculties, see, with mercy or amazement or attentiveness, where everything's unexplainably trustworthy, you know, nothing's missing anywhere, and one learns to live by the, in the light of that. Mm-hmm. Given that you knew Merton, what do you think about him doing that number six in capital letters? It's quite stark on the page. You think this? Yeah, is, yeah. Corey would... says he's yelling in, in <laughs> a, a website talk capital letter. What I think is this: he puts in capital letters. I think in this sense. There is a sense in which you have nothing to do with it. You can't reach it, you can't lose it. And if you could find it or lose it, it's not even what we're talking about. Merton one says, the person who says, prove it, not only are they not at bat, they're not even in the ballpark. See? And you're, you're overtaken by it. It, is, it comes welling up and grants itself unexplainably to you. And that's why it's in capital letters. And it, it grants itself to the innermost hidden center of the soul, see, the summit of the soul. So the way I visualize it, if we draw a small circle, say the size of a dime, and that's, that's the, the hidden center of the soul, the person that we are, culpably. Then there's a wider circle around it, which is our human nature, endowed with the capacity through faith to know the presence of God. So most of God's uh, visitations enter the ego and illumine it, illumine the mind, illumine affect, illumine intentions, and so on. What happens here is that the love of God infinitely beyond us passes right through the ego, mm. right into the hidden center like a shooting star. Mm. You don't even know what happened. Yeah. And then the innermost, the God who is within, see, mingled with the you in God before you were born, radiates right back out and bypasses you again. So the ego is bypassed. So it's betwixt and between mm. the two infinities yeah. that are one. And that's why it's in caps. Mm. <laughs> but secondarily, it, the overflow, uh, the aura, mm-hmm. sweetly uh, illumines the transformed ego. And mm-hmm. John of the Cross spends a lot of time talking about those graces mm-hmm. in the spiritual canticle. You know, the touches of love and the longings and, you know, the journey, like the love journey of one so transfixed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That uh, image was so helpful. And just, I can really sense the confusion for the ego. I didn't yeah. see what like, What was that? <laughs> like, what, what, what was that? What's like, happening? Uh, yeah, and John the Cross, that's why he calls it a what, the what. Mm. He says, you know that it's happening, but you're not able to explain it. So you mm. don't know what it is, because what is the act of the conceptual mind to define it? See? But you can intimately realize something unexplainable, vast and ultimately divine is happening to you. See? Mm-hmm. You're being transcended, yeah. And as part of the cooperation, uh, helping building foundations to allow the ego to cooperate and not be afraid and not be confused, too confused and not be, to be kind of more open. It it really is. And I also think this, is that God works with us with infinite wisdom and gentleness. So again, we said this at the beginning too of the series, the very fact that people are drawn to listen to this, it means they're already on the path of it. And, um, it's a state of increasing ambivalence between means and ends, that at the end is this unexplainable union. But the unexplainable union that lies ahead of us starts unexplainably welling up in the ground beneath our feet, 
that is the very where we are on the path towards it. The hidden center is welling up out of the ordinariness. I also think in daily life, by the way, you can be kind of taken by how unexplainably precious ordinary loving human interactions are. You know, that the simplest of acts, that your awakened heart see that it's ultimate, that God's the infinity of that. And that intimacy is the intimate immediacy of God. You don't announce it at the dinner table because <laughs> people look at you funny. You know, you keep it to yourself. But there is a way of, of realizing the divinity of the ordinariness as an habitual state. And it heightens your sensitivity then to ordinariness, to the suffering within yourself and others, to the gift of everyone, to nature, like that. I think it's, that's, the, that's the growth of it, I think. Mm -hmm. I'm wanting to... Uh, support the divinity. Of, Is that, of the yeah, 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 yeah. And you support it. Martin Heidegger has this saying about um, um, letting things, each thing rest in its own way to be, okay? not imposing your will on it. He said, he said this could look like um, not caring, but it's the opposite. Could this be the hardest thing of all, to let each thing rest in its own way to be? That is, where each person is as we are, an utterly unique manifestation of the infinite mystery of God. And we walk with them in their way to be who they are, mm -hmm. with all their growing edges, just as with God's help we walk with ours. Mm -hmm. you know? So it's really a contemplative foundations of community, I think, and a kind of, uh, yeah. Mm, beautiful. Well... Well, my questions covered. It's very clear. I'm I'm knowing in the unknowing, understanding in the non-understanding. I can tell. I can tell. <laughs> I can, tell. Uh, can I be confused in the confusion, or is that uh, I'm, yes, I'm you, missing something there? <laughs> yeah, you can, you can be confused. Someone once said, uh, uh, "To be with a spiritual teacher is to be with someone who's perhaps as confused or more confused than you are," <laughs> but. They're not confused by the confusion because they know it's just confusion. Mm. We get confused by confusion because we believe the confusion has the authority to name who we are. So, wow, yeah. And that's being truly unconfused. Okay. <laughs> you know what I mean? Of course, all, I'm confused. I mean, what do I know? <laughs> you know, seriously, no, I mean, it's true. Yeah. Mm. Well, we appreciate you sharing out of your confusion. Oh, thank yes. you so much. Yes. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah, thank you for today. You're welcome. Thank you for listening to this episode of Turning to the Mystics, a podcast created by the Center for Action and Contemplation. We're planning to do episodes that answer your questions. So if you have a question, please email us at podcasts at cac.org or send us a voicemail at cac.org forward slash voicemails. All of this information can be found in the show notes. We'll see you again soon.